Welcome everybody to our much, very, very, very highly anticipated call that we have all been waiting on the last, I think, what, six weeks now. We've been counting down the days to have our incredibly special guest, Tom Hugard, come and just pour into our community. I want to start off this call just kind of sharing a little bit about my experience so far with Tom Hugard. And I read his book, um, I think it was probably for the first time about a year ago. And originally I was being taught day trading in a way that was highly difficult, a little stressful, um, not trend trading by any means. And I definitely, um, when I first read his book, I couldn't relate and I couldn't understand it. And that was because I was being taught in a way that didn't work for me. And then when I finally sat down and read his book from start to finish, I was like, this man knows what he's talking about. He knows everything that I've experienced in my trading career, and he knows how to make it better. And I will tell you that, did we lose Tom? Is he still on? You guys will see him. Okay, good. I can't see his face anymore. So... I will tell you that he is the sole inspiration for why we trade the way we do in Forex for Women. He's the sole inspiration for why I even wanted to create this community and why I continue to, and we, us women as Forex for Women owners, why we continue to pour into you all because I see that your life can be changed. I see how my life has changed through trading. And I see how Tom is changing lives consistently through his talks, through his book, through inspiring people around him, sharing his stories of his life and things he's overcome and places he's been and things he's done in his trading that had made it better. And he's inspired me to want to be more like him. And so the fact that we have Tom here in our community, like eagerly ready to pour into us uh, is a huge deal. And I feel extremely, extremely privileged to have him here. And can you guys just all give a huge welcome in the chat? Type 222, type welcome, type thank you so much for being here with us. Because I know he's got a lot of incredible wisdom to share and pour into us. And so I'm going to let him take the floor and, um, and you guys, I hope you have a notebook. I hope you are ready to just, just be inspired. Tom, are you ready? You just you may need, need to un off. unmute you, Tom. Yeah, go figure. Here we yeah. go. There we go. I, can, I can navigate the markets, but I can't navigate my own computer um uh, good morning everybody my name is tom hugard and i'm tuning in from uh, the party central of the world i think it surpasses las vegas i'm in bangkok where i'm giving some talks and uh oh boy it uh i am feeling the jet lag uh, ladies I, I assure you of that um before we really get into it first of all i am blushing uh, it, it's uh, I am I'm almost blushing to the point of tears because I, I I rarely get an opportunity to hear what people uh, think about the book. I want to I, I want to I want to <clears throat> tell you something uh, first and foremost is that, is that if you uh, want to tap into my network of really good resources, I also. I have a wide array of contacts that I'll be more than happy to um, give you uh, names for so you can contact and, 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 and make an introduction because I think you, as part of your journey, you can't become too one-dimensional. I don't have all the answers, but and, and, in, and if I did, it may not resonate with some of you. And I think it's also important that you hear from others. Secondly, um, I want to tell you that I'm a storyteller and that's important for me to convey because uh, the way that I get lessons across is through the 
the use of context, contextual stories, um, and, and you'll see that that's a common theme when I talk. I rarely actually uh, talk from notes. I uh, I usually will have a slide or two, uh, which is obviously what I have done here. Um, but as I said to Amanda uh, moments ago before we joined this uh, uh, this ensemble, is that I'd very much like to just perhaps speak very briefly about my own experience, how, how I got to be here, but that's really not what this is about. This is an opportunity for you to uh, tap into my world and then learn from it because and I, we and we use this we use this concept of well um, you know speaking to uh, Americans um, maybe use an uh, an American athlete but if you were a golf fanatic and you had an opportunity to go to lunch with Tiger Woods um, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily ask him so much about his victories but you would rather hear about the man behind the 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 phenomenon called Tiger Woods. I'm not saying I'm a phenomenon, not by any stretch, but I, I think we are, when we meet our uh, the, the people that inspire us, we are actually less interested in their achievements and more interested in how did you come to be, how did you become an achievement? Sorry, how did you become that person who achieved these things? You know, almost what is your daily routine? Your how do you deal with adversity and setback? And because you know, in life. There, there really cannot be success without failure. It is, it is as impossible as to have only night or only day. They, they coexist hand in hand. And, and, and for me, I find that uh, many people coming into the, the world of trading are actually absolutely shocked by how easy at times it can be to make money, almost to the point of you feel like you don't deserve it. And it because it comes so quickly. And at other times, it's pouring out of your account, even though you're doing absolutely everything right. I mean, it surely has got to be the only business in the world where you go to work in the morning, you do your absolute best effort, and you're poorer for it by the end of the day. Or you show up unprepared, hang, hungover, and really uninspired, and yet you leave somehow miraculously with more money than you did before. No boss would ever accept that. And so that's the irony of trading um, as I know it. And so uh, <clears throat> for me, what I wish to do today is to share liberally of those experiences so that when you travel forth in this particular uh, this cr this crazy arena called the financial markets that you perhaps draw some uh, inspiration from someone who has been in the trenches for quite a while and who has probably seen it all by now. Someone yesterday asked me, how long does it take to become a, a really accomplished trader? And I said, it isn't really the right question to ask. The right question to ask is not how long. I mean, this is not a Malcolm Gladwell uh, story where if you do something for 10,000 hours, you are now by miraculously definition an expert, which is, uh, which is one of my pet peeves about Malcolm Gladwell versus the work that he bastardized by Anders Ericsson. So Anders Ericsson, he's a behavioral expert. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a, is a Canadian journalist who wrote the book Outlier, which is a massive bestseller, which is disturbing in itself because we think as a species, we think that we can somehow quantify the path to success rather than actually uh, beginning to consider, well, what is the path to success? Is it just a question of doing 10,000 hours? I'm sure you've all heard about the 10,000 hour rule. Well, well, that's nonsense because, you know, <laughs> I used, I often bring my, my ex-wife into the, uh, uh, to my storytelling because, uh, you know, by now I'm 54 years old and I must have been behind the wheel of a car for more than 10,000 hours. Yet my ex-wife always jokingly said, you are the worst driver in the world. When you do reverse parking, I have to order a taxi to get me from the car into the curb. That was like the standing joke. And and yet, so the, the more serious story behind it was that, okay, so you've done something for 10,000 hours. So what? It isn't the quantity of hours, it's the quality of trading. Because when you get into any endeavor, in order to, be, to gain what we call 
expertise or expert performance, what you actually have to do is you you have to create an environment where your your, your neural network, uh, this piece of software up here, creates creates pathways. And the way to do that is through solving problems. You know, remember when we were children or when we, the, the way we learned to grow was through repeated mistakes, free repeated errors. And, the, and, the, and the, the endeavor of trading is no different to that. It's actually the learning experience because there is no hard and fast in the financial market. It's more a question of, okay, I don't really, I often say when I trade, my opinion matters not. I actually have to think of, um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this concept of, of, um, of the beauty contest. It, it, it's, it's a quite a sexist um, story, so I apologize in advance. But in an era, thankfully gone by, uh, there was the, the father of modern economics. His name was John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes, he proposed that the financial markets was a bit like a beauty contest uh, where you had um, 30 ladies in, in a newspaper uh, uh, in, in a newspaper competition. And so you had to vote on who do you think is the most beautiful of these 30 ladies. And then you ha had to rank them by, by a, a numerical order from number one to number 30. And, but as, as the competition was centered around that you had to guess in alignment what the majority would guess like. He actually proposed that it doesn't really matter whether you prefer bronze or brunette. What you actually had to think is you had to think in a nip in another dimension. You had to think, what are the others thinking? This is like the, what we call uh, second, uh, second uh, or, or displaced thinking, where you're no longer thinking, oh, I quite like her. Or, no, you have to think, I wonder what the next man, because obviously there's a bit of a, Let's not get into that. But, but so you have to kind of look at the financial market and go, it doesn't really matter whether I think your dollar is bullish or bearish. You have to think, I wonder what the others are thinking. Are they bullish and bearish? And I think that takes trading into a different kind of uh, intellectual game, which for me is incredibly, incredibly stimulating. So for me, it's not just a question of smacking on a Bollinger Band or Fibonacci. It's like, hey, what's the real story here? What am I? What, what am I thinking the others are thinking? And that's where you begin to become an observer of human, uh, of human behavior. And I think, that's, I think that's above all what has really attracted me to trading. I think, and in fact, maybe we should start the story of how this all got started. Um, Amanda, uh, every now and then, it would be nice if you can just sort of uh, come to the microphone and say, Volume is good. We can hear you loud and clear. Um, yeah. Would you be able to do that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, cool. Excellent. So far, sounds so, good. Sounds okay, great. Okay, good. Okay, good. So, um, so I, I, I wrote this speech called Behind the Monitor, uh, which is a 1,200-page uh, beast. Uh, as, I, as I say to people, um, you're actually more than welcome to have the entirety of the presentation. I'm not sure it is so relevant to what we're attempting to do uh, today, but so the the behind the monitor is an attempt to come on, All right? Ah, there we go. Uh, so so the playlist today is who knows? Because I uh, look, I showed up in Amsterdam. I spoke for free. I was supposed to I was supposed to speak for three hours. I spoke for five hours because people had questions. Then I flew to Prague. Same thing. Then I flew to Warsaw in Poland, and same thing. It, it was so it was so funny in, in Poland that they actually just kept me, promising me that they would actually drive me to the airport. Then I flew to Bucharest, uh, and, and again I spoke for five and a half hours, and, and because people have questions, and so I couldn't have the outset have possibly foreseen what their questions would be, and they are as varied as men and women are themselves. And and I always start with, well, we all have a story why we got here today. It could be the story of how we want more money or how we want a better allocation of the time available, how we want to work on our own terms and our own premises. And and all of those are as valid as uh, and as rightful as, as anything. But <clears throat> I think it's very important that people realize the limitations to what it is that we can possibly achieve. So um, let me just see. So 
I start with this story here. I'm going face to face with uh, a couple of thousand people over the last 10 days. And I do that knowing full well that I have lost a significant amount of money in February. And, and when I set off uh, in the airplane, I'm thinking, well, this is going to be interesting because people have this perception of you where they go, man, he's a good trader. Man, he makes a lot of money. And then you hit that uh, out of nowhere. It just hits you. Go, yeah, no matter what you touch, it just implodes. Now, Amanda, I need to just ask you a question because I need to know whether this is um, something that you know about or not. But I run three Telegram channels. Yep. And thankfully, you're nodding now. So <laughs> are your members aware of the fact that I actually run a swing trading channel? I believe so. The chat is okay. saying yes. They all okay, are good. aware. Okay, well, that, yep. that, that kind of helps because I need yep. to just do a little contrast here is that uh, the Swing Trading Channel uh, was created specifically for the purpose of people who wanted to engage with the financial markets but may not necessarily have the amount of time to do it that I have. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm actually writing a second book whether I'll ever see the light of day, that's an entire story. Mm -hmm. However, it, it really is a story about how we use our time, in, in part, at least in part. And I call it primary time and secondary time. So, for example, uh, just a little contextual story. One of the things that uh, irritates me a little bit in this world is the, uh, the this enormous predominance on YouTube gurus who go out there and they tell us how to live our lives. And one of those that really annoy me, and it might surprise you, but that's a gentleman called Tony Robbins. And another one is, 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 uh, is David Goggins. Um, and it's not that I have anything personal about these individuals at all. It is more that if, if Tony Robbins says to me, uh, we all got time to do an hour's exercise, and you know, and, and it is in your moments of de in the moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. Well, no, it really isn't. It is actually what you do every single day that decides your destiny. And and, and when David Goggins he goes there and with his six pack, and it's not that I am male jealous about his six pack. I'm more inspired by the six pack, but I'm not going to get up at three o'clock in the morning and run 25 miles and then bike another 20 miles because I don't have time for that. Okay. I actually have a very compact life. And so it, it, it's ludicrous that someone thinks that you can just invent an extra three, four hours in order to have that perfect body. Yeah, you try running in a household and, 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 and you know, and, and, and so speaking for you, Amanda, I think you have a couple of children. Yeah, fat chance of me just nipping down to the fitness studio two, three hours every single day because I got responsibilities. You know, so try and factor that into your life as well. And that to me is just ludicrous because we take advice from people who have primary time in dictating how people with secondary time should lead their lives. And to me, that's out of alignment. And so I created in part the 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 um, the swing trading channel because I realize and accept that there, there's many people who are generally interested in the financial market, but they may not have six or nine hours of screen time, but they may actually have time to look at their phone going, all right, uh, a, we have an order here in the euro against the Australian dollar up at 190, uh, 165.80. Okay, and there's an explanation why Tom wants to do that. Okay, well, that I can relate to. And then I can go back to it. Okay, my phone pings. Oh, I've been filled. Well, that's quite exciting. And maybe the maybe the, the story then is that you you take these trades and you take them in a, in a very small stake size or you put them in a demo account. And you begin to actually draw some experiences of how um, – of how a professional trader actually goes about his vocation and by and you know almost by, by yeah, i always say you know everybody wants to be a shepherd but no one wants to get up in the feckin mountains and actually experience the hardship and the cold and that's what i and that's what i i think i think that's my, my the annoyance that i have with some of these motivational speakers saying yeah you try and squeeze in an extra free hour. in fact there was a very uh, there was a famous study by a bunch of australian research and, and they they posed this question Hey, how long does it take to live a healthy life? And I thought, oh, 
That's an interesting question. And they figured out that if you want to lead a healthy life, piled onto your normal existence, you'd actually have to invent an extra three hours in the 24 hour cycle. Yeah, because you know, like every every one of us ladies know that, you know, if we really want to look after ourselves, we should have a, a decent breakfast, you know, have a big, big salad for, for lunch, you know, with a lean piece of protein and, you know, and, but, you know, you try and march your way through 10 ounces of broccoli at lunchtime you know, when the clock is ticking, you got to be back to work, plus the 30 minutes you have to do with the chopped cucumbers and the carrots and, and all of these things. And you think, yeah, how the hell am I going to find the time for doing that? It's just yeah. out of alignment. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't know how to live a healthy life. It's like, yeah, but we have other responsibilities. And you and like you, you're, you're mothers to children. Well, I'm a father too. You know, I have children that watch guidance. And, 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 and you, you try and, and balance that without feeling too guilty as well. You know, and don't think for one second just because I'm male and I got the screen time that I don't sit there and thinking, God, my daughter, she could really use a little bit of, of, of TLC now. Okay? And then you and then you grab the credit card credit card and nip down to the local toy store and you buy your way out of feeling guilty. Look, don't tell me you haven't been there either. And this and then you're thinking, oh my God, I'm spoiling my children. So <laughs> I, I I'm every bit as much rooted in the realities of the 24 hour cycle as everybody else is. And so I am extremely mindful that I'm I'm speaking to a segment of the population that I may not necessarily be uh, so in in touch with but because of you know the the whole male female role in say a household but I, I nevertheless I'm, I'm I'm thinking yeah but I can relate I can relate because I have many responsibilities and 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 they are often clashing and so the, the reason why I created the the the, the the swing trading channels to give people that wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity to tap into uh, the excitement of the financial markets an opportunity to see how it's done, but with a but fairly limited resources. So I absolutely commend you for uh, starting this, and and I assure you that that once this become wider known, you're going to have a network. Uh, an enormous network. This, the, you know, it, you just started. Um, I, I, and again, I often bring my ex-wife into the story. Best of relationships, absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and I told her, and I said, "Oh, I'm speaking to a network of ladies." And she went, "Oh, really?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, they, so why is it just females? Well, I think they want to just, you know, cater for themselves, which is, I said, oh, well, that's great, fantastic. I said. Um, don't you flirt with them? <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, um, so 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 that's the story. Now the next see that's what just happened with this 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 uh, this headset here. It just turns itself off. Oh. Yeah, so, so and so I I hear it. So if you all of a sudden hear me talk, do something, okay? So okay, yeah, I, so, okay. Uh, yep. yes, uh, damn Logitech. Guy. Okay, <laughs> so I very much live my life by a mantra that, uh, incidentally, he was an American uh, psyche uh, called Edgar Cayce. And I was deeply, deeply touched and moved by his, uh, his dedication to mankind and his ability to uh, create a betterment in the human condition through what he called his, uh, his readings. And, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with Edgar Cayce, um, but it, it, uh, it certainly is uh, such a beautiful story. Uh, which we can take another time. But he, he said, don't let your heart be troubled uh, and don't let it be afraid as long as you are conscious of your effort. And I very much live my life by that mantra. Like, look, I'm not overly focused about uh, whether I make the money or not or whether I will write that perfect book or, or not. I want to just pour myself into this moment now. And it's very much how I, I live my life. Like, okay, you know, we're very much a society of outcome orientated and I want to move away from that. I want to be, okay, I want to be right here, right now orientated and I want to do the very best that I can do without thinking of how does that 
result in a positive uh, end result. Yes, of course, there has to be a review process. There has to be an audit process because if you really want to um, gain expertise, the only way to gain expertise, I, I use this story um, uh, of, uh, of Anders Ericsson and Anders Ericsson was rather critical about the, uh, the the book and the impact that um, that Malcolm Gladwell had had because he said that's not at all how you gain expert performance. Expertise is not done by you know say say Vivaldi's Four Seasons da 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 da. Well, if that's all you ever practice, of course you're going to be an expert in da 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 da. But a real true master performer is actually not one who has just been told what to do he's been given a task and now he sets his mind or her mind to work in order to solve the particular conundrum and so Anders Ericsson said you can have someone who has done the same thing for 10,000 hours but a practice does not make perfect and you know that's one of my central themes in my talks in my book is that practice doesn't make perfect practice mm -hmm. makes permanent and if you keep practicing the wrong thing you're just going to entrench the the uh, the, the the incorrectness of it and, mm -hmm. and and that's such a critical lesson that we realize well actually we have to have a review process in well, in whatever it is, in whatever endeavor, in our relationship endeavor, take some time out every now and then and, and, and say, hey, honey, is our relationship working? <laughs> and, you know, as a male go, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. What have I done now? <laughs> but, you know, it's like uh, I remember uh, that you, you want to set aside quality time rather than just the quantity. And, and it's such important that in whatever endeavor it is that we do, it's like, well, am I actually just going down the rhythm of, you know, I go to the gym and I, and I put on my iPod and I like, uh, uh, you know, like, or am I actually pushing the boundaries of what it is? And so I very much live my life by that. I, it, I, I guess, I guess I can't be any other way. And that may be through my particular circumstances. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like Freud. Is it nature or nurture? Who knows? But I also think that we shouldn't be too focused. I think uh, Freud was rather anal like that, because I also think that the, 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 the spoken word has the ability to change the trajectory of the personal circumstances of, of life. It can change the direction of a nation. If the right spoken, you know, think of Martin Luther King and how he changed the consciousness of the African-American community to raise themselves to a higher level of consciousness and not accept the status quo. And you know you have to be deeply moved by that but you can also take the lesson behind and go well hang on here the, you know it, it actually has the power to move us in a different direction for better or worse so you know it, how i got started in trading was pure coincidence yeah you know like i was a 18 year old skateboarder with long hair would you believe it and you know mm. that you know a bit happy go lucky was perhaps more interested in the the other sex you know and, and you know just like you know all dynamic school yeah whatever and then uh, i uh, you know i had a terrible disease called man flu I'm sure you ladies know exactly what that means. You know, it's like when your man is on the sofa and it's the end of the world and it's literally just the, the worst disease that could ever inflict a man. So I had man flu, ladies. Terrible disease. <laughs> and my father, he went to the library and he got me just an array of books. Uh, I didn't have a particularly uh, inspiring Thank you, childhood. Uh, oops. Oh. oh, hi. Who we got here? <laughs> All right, I think you're good now. <laughs> okay. There's nothing like a little bit of an IT disturbance to break yeah. momentum, isn't that? Right. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm not supposed to talk about my childhood. That, we'll we'll take that as a little uh, as a little cue. But my father, he did inspire me to read, and so at a very young age, I read the American Grage. You know the the Hemingways, uh, the Graham Greens. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for that. And then by pure chance, he got me a book called Liar's Poker. Liar's Poker is written by an American uh, gentleman called Michael Lewis. And Michael Lewis was a young man who went to England, to London, and to study a degree at London School of Economics. And <clears throat> Liar's Poker is, I guess, is what we call a period piece. You know, I'm not particularly familiar with the nomenclature of 
of, of authors speak. But Amanda, I think Lias Poker is a, a, a period piece, uh, and I'm showing my age here. But you know, when I grew up and I was you know in my in my teens, it was the happy 80s, and we had this thing called yuppies, mm. and they stand for the young, urban, independent. And we just looked them at, oh shit, you got a Porsche. <laughs> that, that, that's what we're like oh they got a car and you know you can imagine someone when you're 18 years old and someone drives around in a really nice car you think oh my god i would love to have that car mm -hmm. and um, that's what lias poker is it describes how he starts working for a, a, a bank i think today is called city group but it would back then it was called salomon brothers mm -hmm. and how he becomes a sales trader and he describes the whole um the, the whole 1980s. You know what the irony, Amanda, is? That he wrote it as a warning. Mm. He wrote it as a warning to all the young men and women all over the world saying, don't get into finance. I read that in an <laughs> article. And I'm thinking, who are you kidding, Michael? That was the greatest invitation because of you and your <laughs> book. You just, you just green carded a million young men and women all over the world to want to go into trading because it was just so who wouldn't want to be in a fast-paced lifestyle with happy-go-lucky attitude and, uh, and 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 holiday all over the world and big bonuses how can you say <laughs> how can you say that this is meant to be a warning <laughs> i love how every now and then there's just people who are butting in and then they're sort of like disappearing again it's like hello um <laughs> Anyway, so I thought, and, and, and here's the here's the, the 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 key thing is like I thought, well, hang on. If Michael can do this, so can I, and I mm -hmm. guess that's what I want. Is that's what I want from for for you, Amanda, mm -hmm. and your uh, your community. Is that I want you to look at me and going, he ain't that smart. I can do that, <laughs> <laughs> and especially especially because I'm leading the way because that's the that's what is meant to be. You know, if you think about the whole experience of mankind you know the reason why we are the apex predator today is because we shared information one of my favorite movies is a movie uh, with um you know that god is called scarlett johansson your hands your hansen and mm -hmm. and morgan freeman it's called lucy and and lucy uh, scarlett johansson lucy she develops she ingests this uh this uh drug can't remember what it's called don't do drugs kids and mm -hmm. um and she now she gets she gains a, an almost a, obviously she gains a superhuman awareness of her own condition, <clears throat> and and she she contacts this professor in I guess I guess in, in in evolution in the form of Morgan Freeman and and she said I don't know what to do with this information and he so beautifully said you know in that Morgan Freeman voice that all of us absolutely love and adore he says well you share that information and mm. so. I made it my mission of I want to share information. I, I, I because it gives me something to share information, and mm -hmm. I was fortunate to meet people who had that same attitude to life in the world. And and I often get asked, why don't you charge for it? Said, but because it's not that I couldn't charge, and and rightfully so, but I want to focus on making my money in the market. It, I shouldn't be focused on whether I get $100 in a subscription fee. I appreciate, understand, and fully get behind that you have a community to run, and of course you should charge something. It, it's not a slight against that. It's like, but I don't want to do that because it's very important that I also have the ability to step back when I don't want a bloody trade. You know, when mm -hmm. I say, listen, everybody, I am absolutely shit, and I need to retreat for a day or a week and figure out what's going on in my mind. Yeah. Because my techniques are, you know, it's not like, it, like say Andy Roddick all of a sudden hit a bad stream or, or Tiger Woods. It's not like that their golf game or their tennis game, all of a sudden they couldn't swing a racket or a golf club. It's like, because obviously there's something going on inside that, you know, w for whatever reason, they can't perform how they really want to perform. So um, anyway, so the story is that I, I started working for, uh, you know, I sold myself to the devil and started working for JP Morgan. Blessed it because, you know, I absolutely loved working for JP Morgan. And I, I loved the whole American culture, which was just like, hey, work as much as you want and we will pay you well. And, you know, you are really the you're really the arbitrator of your own success here. You go for it. You, you absolutely. Is Tom a Virgo or a Libra? 
Well, there's that one from the from the left. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. Mm. So there you go. I'm born on the 19th of September, 1969. So the the, the so the whole J.P. Morgan experience just instilled that uh, work ethic that I am so grateful for. You know, and, and it's not that I didn't have the work ethic before I met her, but when you work for the right, and, and that's why I think circumstances just sometimes also give you that wonderful opportunity to grow if you'll let it. Anyway, I, uh, and God bless them, but they gave you stock options. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I'd saved up. It, it sounds probably going to sound ludicrous to you, but I saved up like $20,000. And wow. I was like, oh, my God, it was a fortune. And mm -hmm. I said, that's it. No more of this. I'm going to be becoming a dependent. I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to be an independent day trader. But, oh, yeah. And my brother, <laughs> he worked for IBM, and he got me a secondhand computer. And I was like, oh, it's a big deal when I got my own computer. And you remember, you have to remember, ladies, that this is two year 2000, 1999. So my internet was this AOL dial-up. You know, mm -hmm. you, you could hear it, and then it went, and then there was a connection. That's what it was like. Wow. And then I, we didn't have, look, I, I say to people now, God, you're lucky to join this particular adventure 20 years later, because, mm -hmm. <laughs> but because I, didn't, I didn't have what you have. You know, you have online brokers, you have charts, you have CNBC, you have Bloomberg, you have Reuters, you have all, you have YouTube that you can learn from. We, we have this. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. It was, it was just, okay, what do I do now? And so predictably, 18 months later, I lost everything. You know, I'd lost all my money, but I had made my way in, I had sweet taught my way into a job at a brokerage that I traded with. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know what, Amanda? I, I can't help but being somewhat as distracted every now. It's okay, but people are sending comments in, mm -hmm. and they're, 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 but it's actually quite sweet. So someone just wrote, 1999, I got married. And then the other one, when I said that, that dial up, that dial up uh, town, someone said, the, the sound of my youth. It's like, isn't it, it true? Is. It, it is. is. So I'm probably just going to see if I can click that so, so, so I don't see that. I just have you two that's okay yep but 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 thank you for the comments it's actually rather entertaining to see because it sort of takes me back oh yeah you know the, i remember being on holiday at my mother's house she lived in spain she'd retired and uh, I, she, she was so annoyed with me because when you used aol no one else could dial in so i had to go down to a local hardware store and buy a 50 meter extension reel and then we borrowed <laughs> the neighbors could <laughs> the neighbor's connection and and i and i remember then that i got a phone bill of something like 200 dollars after my two-week holidays just what you did in order to tap into the financial markets <laughs> so anyway um <clears throat> so serious now so i spent almost 10 years on a trading floor and that's where i really accelerated my understanding of the human condition because you sit on a trading floor and you, you literally, you and everyone else would trade mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. That's where you're sitting at the other end. So when you click buy or sell, I would be the one that would receive those orders. And I had to decide, what do I do with Amanda's long position in Euro dollar? What do I do with Katie's uh, short Euro yen and so forth? And that's when you really learn what is wrong with the human psyche mm -hmm. when it comes to trading. And so, of course, we're sat there in a community. And can I just say that, you know, whether we're ahead of the times, but that was a relatively even mix of men and women. And I, I worked with an American woman called Susan, incredibly competent. Uh, you know, the, the, the most intelligent person on that desk that was Catherine, and she was an absolute genius and options. And we were looked at and going, "Damn, she's intimidating." And but there, but there's a really but there was an even mix of that you know that brute testosterone male force, 
-hmm. and that that re really deep thinking the female component to it and so so it was it was incredible inspiring work environment where there wasn't any uh, like her and him it was just like we are united as a force because we have to rely on each other at and they, in those critical moments but i tell you one of the things that i found hardest about being a uh <clears throat> being on a trading floor working on a trading desk was I came with a JP Morgan work attitude. This is just mm -hmm. a little anecdote, but I came with a JP Morgan work attitude. And when I when I walked into the train floor, people the first day, people were sitting reading newspapers and glossy magazines, like you know, the racing post or hello magazine. And I thought, surely we're here to work. And it's, but I realized that well, if there's no flow, if there's no one trading, you can't you just have to sort of accept that and you know and, and i think that was actually on a personal level that was quite difficult for me i got used to it but then when the when you know when non-farm non-farm payroll say kicked off and you had this like literally there was an inferno around you that's so you learn to really keep cool but you also learn how absolutely displace the human condition is when it comes to risk taking we are literally always doing the wrong thing at the wrong time we mm. are literally not cut out and at, at first it was a reflection of jesus we are bad at, jesus they're bad at trading mm -hmm. i mean you know I, i'm i'm supposed to take the risk on board and i just realized that whenever they were wrong they would just let those losses run. So I just hit, had to sit there as a broker and go back, well, you know what? What can I do? It's not like mm -hmm. I can call them and say, Amanda, get out of your bloody euro dollar position. Wow. Uh, I had I had a, a, a colleague and we invented these sayings. And, and one of them would be like back in the old days when the phone rang it, as a client, it could be a margin call. And we had this, don't answer it. Don't answer the phone. Just get out of the position. Don't put more money into the account. Get mm -hmm. out of the position. We had these sayings like, don't answer the phone. Uh, we had one. The first cut is usually the cheapest cut. So we are sat there on the other side of the equation. And we are. And by the way, if you're wondering if I'm just talking. Uh, uh, no, there's actually going to be quite a sequence of stories. You're of how good. this is well. Just, okay, cool. So. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and so. As my years evolved on the trading desk, I realized we are hopelessly bad at making decisions under pressure. Mm. And that really shaped my own trading experience because it became much more human focused as opposed to tool focused. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, by 2009, the financial crisis hit the world hard and I was made redundant and um, I decided I wasn't going to go and get a, another job I, there was invitations but I had lived a very frugal life like generally had lived a very uh, frugal life because I always knew deep in my heart that what I really wanted to do was to work for myself mm -hmm. that was my dream Amanda Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have wanted to be without the experience of being on a trading floor. But I always knew that what really drove me was something that a community couldn't give me. It was very much of, I'm a very self-directed individual. And actually, I think that if you really, truly sit down with another human being, I think that is such an innate drive in our psyche that you want to stand on your own feet yes we we survived as tribal by sticking together but we also evolving human beings and we have that fine balance between being in the community very mm -hmm. much exemplified by what you're doing and you want to support others to be the very best version of themselves mm -hmm. but you also know that no one but you can make you the best version of yourself. Yeah. And so, um, so now we are in the 2000, late 2009, 
and as the as the slide says, I don't know if your listeners can see the slide, but I assume that they can. And so oh, I left. Did you, want, did you want to share your screen? Have you not seen my screen at all? Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, just share my screen. Yes, yeah, share my screen for a little so, bit. So, yep. So, click the little. Yeah, absolutely. But I thought I had. Well, we did. Don't and then... don't, don't rely on me. Uh, don't don't assume that I know what we're doing from an IT <laughs> point of view. It's okay. Just don't. Just don't. You know what? This is so just relaxed and casual. It's okay, and we've enjoyed this incredibly so far. So we haven't well, needed listen, your screen at all. <laughs> well, well, if you don't need my screen. Then so to hell with it. Amazing. We'll just, we'll just, uh, we can, I can send you the slides uh, afterwards. So anyway, so I am, um, I'm now self-employed, but now it's different. It's different because um, I am now well-funded and I have the mm -hmm. wisdom. I've, I've, I've literally watched the market from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. for practically 10 years. Mm. I, I mean, Amanda, if you ever had to bet on someone making it as a trader, it surely would be me. Mm -hmm. 10 years of intense experience on a trading floor and well-funded. You know, I was, I was a, a relatively wealthy man. I don't think I really needed to work anymore. Now, it wasn't like I was a multi-multi, but, you know, I'd done well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I started trading. And within a couple of months, I'm thinking to myself, I'm just like I was 10 years ago. I'm adding to my losing trades. I'm, I'm chasing the market. I am, mm. I'm bored. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm doing everything wrong. It's like I haven't developed that, that final link. That There's a movie called Batman Begins. Uh, with Christian Bale and Liam Neeson. And Christian Bale is uh, uh, Bruce Wayne. And Liam Neeson is Raj Gold. Have you seen that movie, Amanda? I believe I have, probably a time or two. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's where my maleness shows in, because that's, you know, that's like, I, I'm not a movie buff, but I always, I love the stories behind the movies. And, uh, there's this scene where, uh, where Liam Neeson takes Christian Bale in the form of Raj Ghul, takes Bruce Wayne under his tutelage, and he trains him the art of ninja. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about Bruce Wayne's, the death of his parents. And Bruce Wayne says, if I had the knowledge, I could have protected them. Mm. And, and that infuriates, that infuriates Raj Gaul. He says, knowledge is nothing without the will to act. And it was this, this, this jolt to my psyche going, well, how many times isn't it that we know exactly what to do, but we are incapable of doing it for whatever reason? So I called my mom. That's what sons do ladies and you'll know that so i called my mom and said mom <laughs> it ain't working there's something that is just not right here i have all the knowledge and i can't make it work and she said uh, <laughs> this is so I'll, I'll come and visit me I said yeah no thanks i need something a bit stronger than that <laughs> god bless her and she said well listen son i think this is going to resonate with you in Spain, there's this route called the Pilgrim Route. It stretches from the southern France, northern Spain, the mountain area. And it's a pilgrim route that uh, Christians and religious people have done for the past 800 years. They go to a place called Santiago de Compostela. And in Santiago, it's called, that's right, it's called Caminos de Santiago. You know, what, what's that, um, what's that? movie actor called that was in apocalypse now uh, american fellow sh sh um, the, the way it's called the way martin sheen but thank you thank you whoever mm -hmm. you were martin sheen he's filmed this where his son emilio estevez which i think is also his real life son um he he dies and then he kind of honors his son well 
uh, people have for centuries honored the, for whatever it is, um, they go to Santiago de Compostela to uh, honor the Apostle Jacob. And he's, and my mother said, you know, it's a religious journey, uh, but it's also a very, uh, it's, a, it's a walk of 800 kilometers. And it gives you an opportunity just to maybe put things into context and put them into perspective. And uh, so I started, I thought, okay, you know, that might just be the ticket. I had worked nonstop for 10 years. And maybe what I really need is to just, you know how you sometimes just need a little time to let the lessons sink in. Mm -hmm. And so I started walking and by the sheer grace of whatever you believe in, and I'm not religious, I really am not. And yet it somehow, it feels like he believes in me. <laughs> I met an American gentleman who was a retired Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. And he and I, we walked together and uh, and there's something about the elite soldier soldiery that is deeply fascinating to me not from a conflict point of view but from the the human performance point of view and he taught me how navy seals are trained and i always had this idea would you mind if i just had a little bit to drink oh you're it, good cheers cheers everybody Cheers. Got our stand legs. <laughs> this is my one vice. You know that? It's sparkling water. Yeah. That's that's the that's, a, that's the, the the monk lifestyle that I live. I don't drink alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm a, a recovering alcoholic. I'm nine years sober. Um <clears throat> and uh and I don't even eat sugar anymore. Uh because of of how it affects my body and mm -hmm. uh, but uh, every now and then i love a bottle of cold sparkling water <laughs> love that anyway yeah anyway um so back to the story with the navy seal no actually do you mind if i just digress for a second one of the one of the studies that deeply impacted me was a gentleman called Rodriguez. And think of it in 2012, 2013, he released a study. Um, he, he worked for a brokerage called FXCM. I don't actually know whether they're in existence or not anymore. Um, but FXCM had 25,000 active traders. And so he took the track record of these 25,000 people over a... Do you know this study? Have you heard me talk about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, at least there's one person that don't know the story. That's always something, isn't it? Okay, so Rodriguez, he works for the brokerage called FXCM, and he decides to do an investigation into the performance of the 25,000 people. And so he, he takes all their trades over a 15-month period. And, and just bearing in mind, ladies and gentlemen, ladies, that... These are just FX trades. So this is extremely pertinent to what it is that you and I are doing here. Mm -hmm. he, they are, and, and he analyzes 43 million trades. I mean, but this, this is not a story of, um, of, you know, oh, I'm analyzing Amanda's track record. This is 25,000 people executing 43 million trades over a 15-month period. And he finds that overall, these 25,000 people, they are actually winning traders. Sorry, the, in the amount of trades that they are winning, they have mm -hmm. a hit rate of 20, sorry, 65% of all their trades of winning trades. And on average, whenever they make a winning trade, they average around 40 pips. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, well, that's pretty good, a hit rate of 65%. And when you're winning, you're winning 40 pips. But the problem is that when they're losing, which is the 35%, they're losing about twice as much. So when they're losing, they lose about 75 mm -hmm. Yes, it is in the book. Mm -hmm. This was a test, Amanda, because if you <laughs> didn't know that, you hadn't really read the book. So now I know you have read the book. <laughs> no, anyway, <laughs> joking aside. And so 
I found that piece of research incredibly fascinating because if you're dealing with a sample space as a statistical stamp, sample space, it's hard to ignore the lesson when 43 million trades have been analyzed. And it isn't that these 25,000 people were stupid, ignorant, or unwise. It's simply just because they were human beings. But what was the second leg to that that you may not have known is that Rodriguez then goes on to argue that if they had had a simple risk-to-reward ratio, which is something I hold my hand up on, I don't actually use a risk-to-reward um, concept because right. I always have the opinion that I, I want to – not limit my gains. And that's what you're doing if you have a two to one risk. But he argued that actually, if they had a stop loss of X and then they had a profit target of 2X, mm -hmm. that mass of people actually would have been overall successful. They would have been profitable. And it poses a really interesting question is, well, then what do I have to do to become a, 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 a how, what do I have to do to become profitable? So back to the story uh, of our, our gentleman in the mountains. And so, um, so one of the discussions as an ongoing talks that we had was how do you train an elite soldier? And I always had this vision of, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're Arnold Schwarzeneggers anyway, and they can withstand anything. So, you know, the rest of us never have an earthly chance. But he says that's actually not the case. We are, you know, there's this common misconception that we are pushed to the breaking point. That's actually not what we want to do. We don't want to break people. What we want to do is we want to find the right caliber. And I, I and what I've come to appreciate uh, in my life now, that mindset and attitude it is, is the primary uh, candidate for predicting an individual's journey if you believe you can then actually you can not in a sort of a yes of course i'm going to i'm going to become a, a mark zuckerberg and have 10 gazillion uh, it, it it isn't that kind of mindset it's just a mindset within our own set of circumstances you can be an immense success and and still have an, an ordinary job but you are a, a you are doing it to the absolute most perfection and and so the story that he told me was deeply inspiring because he said, you know, if we want to go from A to B, we break that down into very, very small components. And then we become experts in every bit, every step. But there's this continuous process. Mm -hmm. this, this this continuous process. So I, I think, Amanda, uh, this is the point where I would like a visual aid. Would it be possible for me to share the screen? Because there's something that I want to share with your friends today. Because yeah. I think it's a really uh, important story. So Yes, uh, if you go to the bottom, there should be that little green arrow that says share screen, just like you did earlier. Okay. So does that mean that you can now... Oh, I have to click share. So now, can you see my screen and you can see my laser pointer? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm... Just going to go to this story here. And this is someone that you perhaps know. This is Kobe Bryant. So um, after Kobe Bryant's very untimely and way too early departure from these planes, journalists and sports writers all over the world uh, proclaimed, proclaimed his greatness, rightfully so at least as a sports person. I am aware of the controversy, uh, but let's just focus on the story at hand. But there was one journalist up in London from the Guardian newspaper. He took a slightly different angle. He said, uh, let's not celebrate his victories. Let's celebrate his attitude because Kobe Bryant, a bit like Babe Ruth, another great American. They had an outstanding relationship with failing. Kobe Bryant racked up 14,481 missed shots during his career, well over 1,000 more. And as the journalist argues, Bryant's success story 
began with working to conquer his fear of failure. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, was such an inspiring story because I see how many people come into the trading arena and the reason why they don't take their losses is because they see it as a personal slight against their character. Yeah. So I want to go to another story. See, so I actually did bring Tony Robbins and, and it's not that I got anything against them personally. No, of course, of course, that would be, that would be silly. But I want to tell you this story here because I think that's one of my key messages today. This is the story uh, of Luke Donald. In 2007, I was someone else's plus one at the Ralph Lauren VIP tent at Wimbledon, where Roger Federer played Nadal, Rafa Nadal. And I got to sit next to, I didn't get invited for my dress sense, I assure you of that. As I said, I was someone else's plus one. And I uh, got to sit next to Luke Donald. And I'll hold my hand up. I don't know the first thing about golf. The closest I've ever been to a, uh, uh, to golf is one of those children's potting range, you know, crazy golf. But I was obnoxious. Uh, or, or I was me. And so I said to him, hi, my name is so-and-so. And they're like, oh, well, you don't know. I said, oh, so you, you're a professional? Girl. So um, why are you not as good as Tiger Woods? <laughs> and I didn't mean it as an insult. I meant it as a, you know, what makes him so special and why aren't you there? And and he took it, thank God, in the spirit that it was meant. He said, I am as good as Tiger Woods mechanically. Tiger Woods can shoot that ball straight. I can shoot that ball straight. Tiger Woods can putt like anybody. I can putt like anybody. But the key difference between L- Luke Donnell and Tiger Woods, and why I am 17, and he's number one, is that Tiger Woods has a goldfish mentality. It is as if the man cannot remember his failures. He's so entrenched in this moment now that, Amanda, can I just make sure you can still hear me? Yep, you're good. Good. He's so entrenched in this, what Eckhart Tolle says, in this moment now, Mm-hmm. That if if um, if Tiger Woods and I have made a bad mistake on the fifteenth hole, and we're walking over to the sixteenth hole, getting ready to shoot the ball, probably showing my ignorance about golf here, getting ready to tee up, I think it's called. <laughs> I will still be remembering my last losing trade. I will still be remembering how I badly messed up the last putt. But mm-hmm. Tiger Woods, it's as if he doesn't have that. It's as if he has been from an early age schooled. And so I said to him, well, surely that's something that you could train your mind to as well. And so, and he said, yeah, well, I'm working on it. No, fast forward then to 2012, I decided to check on, my, well, how did it go? And so in 2012, I found this headline here. This is written approximately five years after I met him. Luke Donald credits his mental coach for the rise to number one. And to me, that was an incredible story because it isn't that all of a sudden his golf game got so much better. No, he started working on the mental component. And so what I'm saying here is that we will very quickly build up a tool set when it comes to technical analysis and analyzing the chart. But what really is the deciding factor in our success as traders is how we think when we are winning and how we think when we are losing. But actually, uh, Amanda, there's a second leg to this story because I got curious. See, so uh, as I said, I'm here in Bangkok and... As I'm standing on the stage on Saturday morning and I'm giving my talk, this marathon talk, I I thought, hang on, I forgot something. I forgot to check if Luke Donald maintained that level Mm. of, 
And so I went back to my hotel room. This is my I'm in a hotel flat here. And uh, I started doing some research a couple of days ago, late into the evening, what happened to Luke Donald. And I found that by 2015, by 2000, late 2013, he dropped out of the top 50. And by 2015, mm -hmm. he was something like 600. And I found out what the coach name was. It was Dave Allred, uh, A-L-R-E-D. And so I began to look into Dave Allred, the, the, his mental coach that was accredited to his meteoric rise. And there was a particular interview with him where he kind of alluded to why he was no longer working with Luke Donnell and the motivation for Luke Donnell to fire him. It turns out that Luke Donnell uh, wasn't, he, he kind of lost his passion and he, he wanted to not be so micromanaged and he just wanted to go back and play golf how he enjoyed to. And mm -hmm. to me, that was an interesting story. And it's not a slight against Luke Donald, but they're also, and I think this is really important to, to bring to, to everybody's awareness that I, uh, uh, that I became aware that there was this, there was this comment that Luke Donald said, that said, you know, he has a wife and he has three beautiful girls and he had made enough money and and i thought to myself that's a really interesting comment because it almost felt as if that he didn't have that hunger anymore like he did when he was fresh out of college mm -hmm. and by the sheer grace of god that i don't believe in <laughs> the irony of it is abound is that i have that hunger for whatever reason and no matter how much wealth I have accumulated, I actually badly want, I badly want to become better. And so I think it's important for me, having been invited in the capacity that I am today, to also make your fellowship mindful of it, that there's also a passion behind it, that, it, that there's this fire inside. And... I don't understand why he lost his fire. But I also know that, and I say that maybe somewhat paternally, I say to you, if you lose your fire and passion for trading, step away. Because then you don't really have that, shall we say, that burn to see you through the hardships. And I think that is such a vital component to trading is that you also think this is not only a great way of earning money, but it's also an extension of my own personality because I like to push my way out of my comfort zone. You see, the only way where we really truly learn is if we are stretched. You know, where we, it doesn't have to be a stressful situation, but where we are really truly learning about, you know, how much metal can we put up with is to put ourselves out operating outside an area that, that doesn't become familiar to you. And I think most people actually thrive there if they feel that it's a safe environment. And so for me, trading is this extension of, and I'm a high stake trader. And so sometimes I will lose what people make in a year. I can lose in a matter of minutes. And don't for one second think that that isn't stressful it, because it absolutely categorically is, especially when you are an independent trader and especially when you hit a losing streak. But there's a fundamental love for the game, that love for the game where you this, this curiosity of, oh, God, this is interesting. But more and more today, is it's not the mechanics behind trading that I'm interested in. It's my own role within the mechanics. And I want to give you a, a, an insight into that through some, some charts. One second. And so he, here's a and, – and then what I suggest that we perhaps could do is that we could say, okay, I'm going to finish that. And then we open up for questions. 
But what I want to do is, because I'm quite certain that your community has a fair amount of knowledge, I want to just, and, and we, I don't want to be too chart-centric here, um, because as I argue, we can very quickly learn charts, and I can give you all the resources uh, that you, you can go and become an expert yourself. But I want to show you something that I find deeply interesting. What you're seeing there is uh, one of my orders in uh, in this in this case it's the euro against sterling and i have a sell order resting there at 8670 and the chart that you're looking at is a 4 hour chart so you know this is a, a fairly uh, large time frame spanning i think a couple a couple of months if not 3 months yeah you're with me so far amanda yeah good Good, 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 good. Okay, and and down there in the right hand corner, you'll see that every horizontal line is approximately is twenty pips or twenty points, as I call them. That order is derived using my particular set of of of, of viewing the market. But what I want to do is I want to take you through the same chart, but through the prism, not prism, but the prism of mm -hmm. other other people's other people's perception of the chart. So the first one is the same chart, but now is using Bollinger bands. Right. So, so down here, that horizontal line on the Bollinger band is exactly at the same entry point as mine. But they are using a two standard deviation approach to the the trade rather than my particular way of trading. Okay, the next one is something that if you aren't familiar with bottom bands, I'm sure you're familiar with a trend line. So here I've basically connected two highs and mm -hmm. I've projected that line out to, to the future. And that would uh, dictate that there would be overhead resistance at 8670. So now mm -hmm. we got my particular recipe we got bollinger bands and we got a normal trend line now let's look let's look at another one okay so now it's basically just a normal old old this is an old support area and right. we are now assuming that that's going to become new resistance you know the, the you, know, you know the old saying you know old support is new resistance and old resistance right. is, is new support i'm sure you know that just as well as i do okay so th let's do the next one and and, and so that that line is also at 86.70. So you're thinking, well, that's a many that's that's many ways of deriving the same answer. Mm -hmm. Then then that's the next one. Now we're using a moving average, and I'm using the most popular moving average setting, I think, which is the 200 period moving average. Well, guess what, Amanda? That comes in at 86.70 as well. <laughs> you know, the plot thickens. This 86.70 is this ma this magical area. But let's do another one. Okay, um, here's a weekly chart, not a four hour chart. And so what I was afraid of is that you couldn't see that so clearly. So I've zoomed in uh, doing a really big snapshot. But so what you're seeing here is a snapshot of the previous chart. And this is a really zoomed in. And do you see that the high that you see here, mm -hmm. my order is just above the old high. And that mm -hmm. brings me to perhaps one of the most important things that I feel that I could teach you today. <clears throat> if you ever want to see a true gentleman in action, go to my YouTube channel and listen to the recording that I made of Dr. David Paul. Okay. Uh, he's Dr. David Paul sadly passed away in July last year. And I sat by his hospital bed and it was really quiet because he was, he was an important man to me. And he was my best friend. He was a little older than I. And uh, uh, he was just taken from us too early. But he had a saying. Uh, he, uh, he said, I always want to place my orders where the majority of traders place their stop loss. Mm. It was just one of those deep, deep insights into the human condition. Because when you think about it, Amanda, when we place trades, where do we always place our stop losses? 
I mean, it's it's like a human curse, isn't it? It's like, okay, uh, I'm selling short here and I'm putting my stop loss above the old high. Of course you do, because that's what we all do, isn't it, ladies? We always place our bloody stop losses in the most conventional of places, which is above old highs or below old lows. Tell me if I'm wrong. It, it right. isn't that. That's exactly. And so David Paul, he had this 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 insight that actually that's where I get stopped out. And how many of us haven't been in that situation where we we get stopped out only to see the market then turn around and bulldoze its way in our anticipated direction? It's almost like it feels like a, it feels like a conspiracy. Where there's like they know they 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 know where my order is and they're just out to get me. I mean, who of us haven't sat there going, oh, they just they know where my stop loss is. And so I warmly recommend that you go to my YouTube channel and you listen to this giant, this intellectual giant talk about how and he taught me these things, Amanda. He taught me this. You know, I, re I remember the first time I ever met him. Uh, it was in a seminar room in Johannesburg in South Africa. And the story how I got to be there was in itself a marvel because he'd been to uh, London and had him and his colleague had a seminar company. And they can you hear me again? Okay, I lost you there, didn't I? It, it caught out. I think um, you're good. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, they had a seminar company, and I, I wasn't there, but they came in and pitched it to, um, uh, to, the, the, to the boss because they wanted to train our clients, which made a perfect sense. And they said, well, we have Tom Hugard who does that anyway, uh, but thank you very much. But my boss, he was a rather cynical a-hole. He was. I mean, he was a lovely guy, but he was really cynical when it came to charts. And when I came back from whatever, I wasn't there. He said, there was this guy who came in here and he actually made me a chart convict. He made me believe in charts in 30 minutes. Wow. And I said, uh, that must be a really special man. And mm -hmm. so he gave me, they, they had left their, their notes for the uh, for the, for what they wanted to teach a client. And I looked through this, I'm going, wow, this is deep. And so I emailed them and I asked, when is your next seminar? Because I really feel like, uh, I feel like this David, he he's my kindred spirit and I, I want to meet him. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we got, uh, uh, we got a talk on Friday or whatever it was. I think it was Wednesday. And so I ran into my boss and I said, boss, can I have a few days off? <laughs> and by the way, can I go to Cape Town? Or sorry, can I go to Johannesburg? And so off I went. It's like literally just rush home and, and pack some clothes. Because sometimes, and, and I'm not an impulsive human being, but it just felt like this was, it was meant to be. And I walked into that seminar room and the irony was that my suitcase was in, my suitcase was, so I sat for three days in this course, just wearing my jogging trousers that I've been worn wearing in the plane. But him, David and I, it was like we it was like we had always been friends, but we just discovered each other. And mm -hmm. he and then he taught me, Amanda, probably one of the greatest lessons that I teach to anybody else. He says, you know what separates an average trader from a good trader? The average trader doesn't add to his winning positions, but a really good trader adds to his winning position mm -hmm. and, 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 and now i know that i don't add to my winning positions in the swing channel and the reason why i don't do that is because i have decided that i i would I, I want to give people an experience like a safe environment with orders but the <clears throat> adding the act of adding to a winning trade is perhaps the advanced lesson and mm -hmm. it's 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 somewhat extreme, and the reason why I'm losing as much as I am not in my swing trading, because my swing trading is like my saving grace at the moment. But the <laughs> reason why it is, trust me, it is. If I if I didn't have my swing trading, I would have had to refund my account. Uh, I may 
yeah, I lost, uh, I've lost 120,000 uh, pounds. I think that's about $150,000 in four trading days. So it's fair to say that I'm going through a, a pretty rough time at this it's, moment it's, in time. Yeah, I know that I... Back. It's just a pullback. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, so David Paul said to me, "What you really want to focus on is do the thing that your psyche don't want to do," and that actually opened up a gateway in my life about how the human mind works and how we always are inclined to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. We always mm -hmm. want, and so I wrote recently. And I think I published it is that if you ever feel like uh, taking profit, that's probably the right time to add to your position. And mm -hmm. if you don't feel like taking your loss, then it's most likely the right time to take your loss because the human mind is constructed in a way that it at all costs tries to avoid pain. It is mm -hmm. at its basic premise, the amygdala, it kicks in and as its main premise wants to protect us against pain. And it could be real pain, perceived pain, but it would at any cost um, try to narrate your decision making so that you don't experience pain. It's you know, just at its fundamental level is the reason why we stay in relationships a lot longer than perhaps we should, because we don't want to take the pain of, of the breakup. There's a reason why we stay in losing trades a lot longer than we should, because when we're simply just deferring the pain to some, to, to the point where it becomes so overpowering that we simply have to take the loss or we mm -hmm. haven't got any more money on the trading account. And so what David Paul basically taught me was to, was to how to reprogram my mind. No, he didn't teach me that because I had to teach that myself, but he, he gave me the, uh, the insight into that's what I want to do with my life too, is to always go where my, my habitual mind, my, my, I always say, you know, we live in 21st century bodies, but we we still have a, a thousand year old mindset. And so my life has become very much about doing what my conscious mind, uh, sorry, what my subconscious doesn't want me to do, including mm -hmm. that when I am winning, I don't think about um, taking half profit. I proactively go, okay, my subconscious wants to get out of the position why does it want to get out of a, a winning position well because it wants to protect me against the possibility that the market will take away my profit yeah and that's a really key distinction that you need to work with ladies if you are sat in a winning position and your psyche begins to send you signals to say, hey, maybe I should take some profit. Well, then it's highly likely not the best of idea to take your profit because that's mm -hmm. merely just your, shall we say, your subconscious that is trying to protect you against the pain of maybe seeing some of your profits disappearing. Yep. Now, great, great. So you're saying, yep. So when someone says, yep, you get it. Now, yep. we, we can know something uh, academically. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we can know something academically, but we don't actually truly believe in it uh, emotionally. Right. So, so, so and, and that goes through in, manifest, in, in many facets of life. And, and so from my point of view, I've very much made my life uh, around being mindful of what it is what my my body is telling me and and being mindful of that body mind connection in particular when it comes to trading but what you have to at least appreciate here that i'm not just a chart nerd i'm a very much a human being who is focused around upgrading my 5000 year old software to the 21st century so that it is in alignment with the deeper purpose for what it is that I'm trying to do, which, and I hate to be so blunt about it, but it is to make money. Okay. It, <laughs> it is, it, 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 it might be that the money is the byproduct of the right kind of behavior, but I got to pay right. the bills and it mm -hmm. is what drives me not for the sake of that. I want to live an affluent lifestyle of Ferrari and penthouses, but so that it is a reflection of me being the 
best version of myself. And in order to be the best version of myself, I need to fulfill certain criteria, which is I need the knowledge, but I also need the, 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 the mental uh, freedom to not be impeded by the psychological uh, suppression that I have by a fear mind. And, and an amygdala that kicks in and so very much a lot of my uh training which i'm happy to discuss with you much of my training is also centered around breaking down the blockages whereby my knowledge isn't allowed to flow freely but that i'm held back by my my own insecurities my own doubts and mm -hmm. I know, I know perhaps this is perhaps getting way deeper than you ever thought. And maybe I've lost half of you. Maybe I've lost 90% of you. And so let that be it. But it's really important for me to instill in all of you that the charts are not going to make you or break you. It really yeah. isn't. It's you who are going to make you or break you. And, and that is, for me, probably the most important lesson. And then, you know, we can... I mean, I got a million slides. We could go through that. But it that is the key lesson for me is to instill in you that actually the real battle in, in trading, swing trading, comes down to your own belief system and how we navigate around that inherent 5,000-year-old piece of software that wants to protect you, Amanda, against any kind of pain and hardship and actually you embrace that, not in a yeah. sort of a, a masochistical way or a manly brute force way, but in a subtle in your own way. And, 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 and what I was so deeply admiring about the, the Navy SEAL was that there was a on the surface of thing, this, this, uh, this specimen of a male, you know, just strong in mind and strong in body. But actually there was a very... There was a very sensitive human being behind that facade that mm -hmm. was deeply in touch with his 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 own uh, his own dreams and hopes and aspirations for himself, but also his own limitations. But just chipping away at those limitations, I think that's what I admire. That those are the people. I, I'm not I'm not uh, enamored by the the big bravado, the big the big the big hand move, the bar movement. I'm, I'm, I'm enamored by stealth. Mm -hmm. I'm enamored by, you just get on with it, but you have an audit. You, you, you have a review and that's what, um, that's from, from my research. Oh my God, I got way too many slides. There, mm -hmm. That's what I took away from Luke Donald was that the coach actually just micromanaged him. In the end, he didn't like it, but the way he got to number one was through an almost anal attention yeah. to the micro improvements. So, hey, Amanda, how long have we been talking now? Uh, probably a little more than an hour and a half or so. Hour, and, yep, about an hour and a half. Really? Yeah, oh I know. God. We're having fun here. Time yes, is we are. Time. <laughs> and we so appreciate it oh my gosh I wish I don't know if you can see the chat but they are just absolutely loving every word coming out of your mouth it is so inspiring well listen that surprises me um Hi. well it surprises me because this isn't a talk about trading you do know that don't you this well, is yeah, a, because you know this why is I the, love it? it's because well, like on. you said in the beginning in the beginning it's not about the strategy it's about you being a human. And so the what you're discussing here is literally solidifying that. Like this isn't about strategy or technical analysis or what's happening on the chart. It's what's happening in inside of you, which is Okay, well let's 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 turn the tables. Uh oh. Amanda. Well, <laughs> easy. Where do you get your training from? Your formal training. You know, who trains you in the art of the charts? Please tell me, because I may be of some help there. Uh, me, and myself, and I. <laughs> I originally learned trading from 
a whole bunch of gurus um, calling themselves educators, and I just could not find success. And so I backed away from all of the noise that was happening in the guru world and developed my own system for seeing the markets and taking action in the markets. And is that the philosophy that then you are now passing on to your network of traders? Yes. Okay. My heart is That's... beating out of my chest right now, just so you're aware. <laughs> I'm I'm not interviewing you or interrogating <laughs> I you. I, I am I am I'm merely uh look at me as your father, just trying to get the very best out of you so that you can pass that on. Okay. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, I hope that my swing channel uh, can somehow also inspire you to, to open your horizons to what is possible out there. Yeah. What do you think about, look, uh, this doesn't have to be the last time we do this by no means. I have really enjoyed myself. I, I don't want to apologize for getting emotional about David Paul, but it, it surprises me how much it has affected me because when some, when you really meet someone that makes a difference in your life, it's mm -hmm. difficult to lose them. Yeah. Um, um, but having said that, um, I have really enjoyed this uh, opportunity to just uh, address your community. But I'm also conscious that perhaps th there's a missing link because if I was a lady sitting out there going, okay, this is great. Okay. So, you know, he's made it and, you know, he's talking about what I need to focus on, but surely I do need, I need some foundation. I mean, I need to learn. Yep. I, I, I need to know what a bloody chart is, or I need to know right. what a current, <laughs> currency is. And I guess I could just leave that in your trusted and absolute capable hands. Um, but would you mind if I addressed your community and told them, how a professional trains. Yes, would that, please. Would that, we would, would that. that. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. I think this is it. Okay. Yeah, go. Okay. So um, I start off with a couple of pictures. Uh, um, there's a gentleman in America called Andrew Huberman who has deeply uh, uh, inspired my thinking by being mindful of uh, the, the, the the, the dopamine receptors in my mind. Um, not that I wasn't aware of that before, but he just had a way of, of verbalizing and crystallizing my thoughts about it. And so I, I, I take this picture of the, uh, the lioness and I, I, I think she's us and she's hungry mm. and she's looking at the, the wildebeests. And if we had been here together physically, Amanda, I, I would have then pointed, I can't, I guess I could do it with a laser pointer. So you're looking at these wildebeest and I always, and so jokingly, when I'm then in a, in a talk situation, I go, that's your dollar, that's sterling dollar, oh, that's dollar <laughs> Swiss, that's the NASDAQ, that's the Dow, uh, and that's the S&P 500, and that's a Bitcoin over there. And, and so we have this, this smorg, smorgas board of things that we can trade but that lionist you know she doesn't go oh what should i have today right she, she carefully selects her target and then she has an inordinate amount of patience and the irony actually is also from what i have learned in my studies is that eight chases out of nine fails for the lioness mm -hmm. you know but it it's like she doesn't have a choice she has to do that and so she also has through the very act of staying alive and feeding herself and her family she has to accept failure and then keep at it and i'm often thinking that when we are confronted with a trading platform i trust you can see my laser pointer mm -hmm. you know that is an enormous stimulus to the mind and that's not always necessarily so healthy for mm -hmm. our minds because we are enticed like 
Bitcoin is luring you in. Euro dollar is calling you like the siren song. You know, like like in the old in the old Greek Greek mythology where the sirens were calling the sailors. Sorry about the sexism here, but like, oh, you were calling us in. They were like, oh, we had to tie ourselves to the mast to resist the singing. I'm thinking of that screen. My four monitors are calling me, going, trade with me, trade with yeah. me. So uh, very much. You you need also to build up some resilience to counteract the very nature of how our minds work. And so the way that I I go through my day to day is I review my old trades yeah. and I I warm up my mind every day. Now I don't necessarily think that that's so necessary if you are a swing trader, and I think that's what I like about swing trading is that you are actually physically removing yourself from the screen and trust me the screen isn't always your friend in fact yeah. i would say most of the time it's not your friend and mm -hmm. that's why i think that just swing trading is uh, i think i'll always swing trade but i don't think i'll always day trade um and and so i practice being here which is very much an eckhart toll thing uh conscious being subconscious but if we're getting more practical if I was going to be more practical and I was going to perhaps suggest some guidance as well to your network, it, it, it's not going to be a $2,000 course. No, it's a, it's a rather humble book that will set you back about 20 bucks, $20. And it's, but it's written by a colleague of mine that I have met, oh, 17 years ago. Uh, there are many, many candlestick books in existence mm -hmm. but what i like about this one is that clive lambert he's a real trader and so he doesn't he doesn't mince his words he gets to the point because for him it was right it was about writing a book that wasn't about selling books so it wasn't like trying to pad the message to build up a bulk of pages so that you could charge more for the book it was fine all right, this is how we deal with this. This is how we deal with this. And I recommend this book for two reasons. One, if you think about trading uh, as something that you want to get into, then investing $20 is sort of within the realms of being a reasonable expenditure. And right. I'm, for me, I'm all about, I don't want to lead people into several thousand pound courses because mm -hmm. I think that's misleading and, and you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. But a really good quality book will serve exactly the same purpose as a $2,000 course. Uh, but if you then really want to begin to get all nerdy about it, then I think that the, the, the American, uh, and, and I do, and, and I'm very happy to uh, facilitate a contact if you don't know who Al Brooks is. But Al Brooks, he's... He's written uh, about price action to an extent that no one before him had ever done. And that's what I really admire about Al Brooks. I met him and he's a really, really nice gentleman. I believe he lives in, I'm going to say San Clemente, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but I'm sure you could persuade him to do a talk as well. Um, and, and I think that you're, your listeners would get a lot out of that. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. And so if you wanted to have that next step up, then that's also a brilliant way. But I warn you, okay? I warn you, that is now you've moved from a, okay, yeah, that's a bit like a bedside reading if I want to, too. This is a study. This right. is not bedtime reading, okay? I'm just putting out a fair warning there, okay? Now, Okay, now it's no longer, oh, that's a bit of a, you know, I got half an hour to myself. The kind of, right. this is like, okay, now I'm moving <laughs> up in the, in, in, in the echelons of training. Um, but actually, and, and this is perhaps a bit of a stupid recommendation because it's more centered around uh, day trading. But one of my greatest investments was buying a printer. And then, uh, just bear with me. So even after I'm traveling, I will I get the hotel reception to print out the charts. Mm -hmm. And then I sit there like another bespectacled nerd. And I'm, I'm, I'm basically training my mind to, okay, what would I have done there? What could I have done better? 
But you have to understand, Amanda, that I'm relying on no one. I have to be self-reliant. And so right. part and parcel of the training is also me. Uh, and, 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 you know, a little less can do as a swing trader. You, you can actually have a, as my mother would call it, and I'm joking here, mom, <laughs> sorry about that. Son, when you know you're going to get a real job. <laughs> she, said, she said that to me. <laughs> Say, Mom, this is my real job. You okay? Yeah. You have no idea. You have no idea how demanding this is because you're so self reliant. And so, part of my daily routine, Amanda, is to print out charts and go through them meticulously. And you know how I really do it? Because the mind is such a fucker. Okay? It, it is an incredibly cheating little thing. So, what I have to do. Just gonna turn a bit. Okay. It gets a bit nerdy now, ladies. I'm sorry about that. So I sit here <laughs> with the chart, and then I have a blank piece of paper on the other side. And then I reveal one bar chart at a time. Because now my mind won't jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. See, if you just take a chart and go, Oh yeah, I would have sold the top and I would have closed my short position at the bottom. Because that's how the mind works. The mind is a filtering little effort, and it will always filter out the things you don't want to see and so you and, and only let you perceive the things that conform to the narrative that you have already decided in your mind you know yeah. it's, you know it's a bit like when we choose partners you know we go out and you choose your man or you choose your your woman well we have these these filters go oh, yeah, i really like the brunette i really like the Da -di -da -di -da. And actually, right. we're perhaps not really opening our mind to, yeah, there could be other that because th that's being filtered out. You know, I can do a much less uh, intimate example and say, hey, Amanda, uh, what car do you drive? Oh, you want me to answer? Uh, it's a truck. Yeah. So you drive a <laughs> truck. Now, yes. when you when you bought that truck, I'm sure that has a name and a brand. Um uh, maybe this is going to fall a little bit flat on face because I'm not too familiar with American cars, but okay. So I'll do a different example. Do you know that okay. car, you know, the, the car called the Volkswagen Beetle? Yes. You know, that's like that, that bobble. And it's like mm -hmm. a remake of a 1960s popular uh, car anyway, uh, or, or earlier. Than that. But if you ever owned one of those cars before that, you never really notice it. But now mm -hmm. that you own and you drive that car, all of a sudden someone is flashing you. And it's another Beetle owner. And so there's this community of Beetle car drivers all over the world. And whenever they see another Beetle, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, and it's like right. you notice the, the things that you didn't notice before. Now you notice it because your consciousness has allowed that to filter in. Yeah. So when I'm training, if I just look at this going, oh, yeah, I would have ignored that losing trade. Oh, yeah. But, but by seeing it, one bit at a time, I'm essentially mm -hmm. doing what I call expert performance or as Anders Ericsson calls, deliberate practice. I am known, I was in the gym yesterday morning, 5 a.m., 5.30, this guy walks in. He looks like he shouldn't have been there. He walks up on the treadmill and then he does this. Uh, <laughs> how is that exercise? It is an exercise. You're just there because you can tick that little thing in your in the box saying i went to the gym this morning but mm. tr true enhancement of performance coming of being mindful of where was i yesterday and so my training goes okay all right what would i done here what would i done here and i'm revealing one piece of information at a time that's how i as a a a, a trader actually trains and one of the uh the, the charting platform that i use i don't recommend it but I use it. I don't recommend it because it's a cost. And I, I want to be mindful. I don't want to entice people to buy anything that they don't need. But I have a, a charting package called eSignal. Mm -hmm. I actually don't have it for real-time data. I have it for delayed data. But I use it to train, Amanda, because it allows me to go into what they call replay mode. And it allows me just to put one bar at a time and that's yeah. what i need to train because otherwise I go, oh yeah i would have known anyway mm -hmm. do you know i'm really conscious of your time and i'm conscious that i'm talking 100 miles an hour and i haven't given you an opportunity to ask questions so you know we are pushing the two hour mark yeah let's 
uh, maybe we should give your community an opportunity to actually, you know, stop this verbal diarrhea and yeah, I'll allow them to Love ask. It. Let's do it. I love that. Do you guys want to post your questions in the chat? And then do you mind if I stop your screen share? Uh, yes, go ahead. You knock yourself okay. out. Okay. Um, post your questions in the chat, ladies. And I actually have a question that I wrote down at the very beginning of this, um, mostly because of your story of how you were on the floor um, back when you first started trading. And you said because there was no YouTube, there were no gurus, there was nobody doing what you were doing. How did you teach yourself to trade successfully? Is it just, where did you come up with your way of seeing the market? I guess is my question. Okay. Uh, first of all, when I am I still being heard? Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, when you spend 12 hours a day, you- right. you you, you, you get a, a sense for the rhythm of the market. Can I just interject here, uh, ladies, of course you can have the PowerPoints. I'll, I'll email it to Amanda and then Amanda can share it to the group. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, with greatest of pleasure. Um, I learned through the giants that came before me, the, okay. uh, the, the, the Bryce Gilmore's, the Larry Pesavento's. I could also make you a connection to Larry Pesavento if you want. Wow. A oh, real indeed. old. He's a. Uh, he, I think he's eighty. He's eighty or eighty-one now. He lives over in Tucson, in Arizona. Okay. And he would absolutely love to come and talk about his life as a trader. But but perhaps more than me, he's very much a swing trader, but he's okay. very, he's very Fibonacci orientated. So it's mm -hmm. very much ratios and ABCD. He, he basically, he actually wrote a book called pattern recognition with Fibonacci ratio. And I think it won an award for the best trading book of the year. Wow. Um, there's actually many people that are asking me, what is my opinion on your strategy? Amanda, I don't know what your strategy is. And, 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 and of course I don't mind, uh, learning about your strategy but i think it's perhaps more important um for me to say that i actually just learned by almost using that canyon that philosophy of it doesn't really matter what i think i need to become habitually uh focused on what is it that the others are doing if i could give you a, a, a an example of an approach of my research mm -hmm. it, it it is to um, sorry, let me just rephrase. One of the ways that I analyze the market in my research is I have this idea that if the market goes above an old high, we may see a big move, but more likely we'll see the market clear out all the orders above an old high. And so when you study my swing trades, which of course I recommend you do, and you can you can actually go back and retrace them all the way back to in August, I rethought my approach. And since then I've been very profitable in the in the in the swing channel. You will see that every single order, Amanda, is resting just above an old high mm -hmm. or below an old low or sometimes just inside, depending on the circumstances. And then I write the explanation why I'm doing it. Well, it, it's actually, it's, it's centered around the idea that I want to place my order where I think the market has cleared out what mm -hmm. some people call liquidity. It's, mm -hmm. it's extremely centered around this. All right, there's people that are going to be stopped out. It's not, I rarely engage in breakout strategies. Mm -hmm because they rarely work very well. But the problem is that whenever we search for breakout strategies, our minds, our eyes will always seek the ones where they do work and they will miss out all the ones where it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. my strategy as a swing trader is extremely focused around the, the narrative of placing my order at a point where I think the market has just exhausted liquidity. Now, yeah. one of the downfalls and, and i say this to all of you listening is that when you are swing trading there is a, an inherent limitation of swing trading amanda and, and all of you 
in that we can't react to news. And sometimes, right. like for example, I had a losing trade in yen a few days ago. That mm -hmm. came on the back of the Bank of Japan making some noise about how they felt about their own currency. And I was, you know, it, it was a very strong move. And I, um, and, and there, there was, it was just what we call a momentum move. And mm -hmm. so sometimes when you're just, uh, sometimes when you're just caught up in an avalanche, you're just going to go back and go, all right, the stop loss will take care of it. But, you know, there was no way that I could foresee that news would have broken. And, and, and if I'd been there and I could have maybe reacted on it, but that's the limitation of a swing trading is that we, you know, we don't change our 401ks just because Donald Trump or, or, or someone says something. We just ride right. with it. Oh, well, we're shit out of luck today. And I think right. that's really important that sometimes it's not just because you lose doesn't mean you're wrong. Right. <laughs> you've done anything wrong. You just, oh, yep. well, and yep. move on. Yeah. That's so good. Kelsey said, what is the worst or biggest mistake you've ever made and how did it shape your trading going forward? The first trade my was my worst trade. I mm -hmm. I shorted the Dow Jones index. Uh, this is uh, 1999, and you are in the midst of a raving bull market, raging bull market, and I shorted it, and then I added to the losing position. Mm -hmm. So I, I sold short more, and so mm -hmm. I lost my entire account in the space of a week. Wow. That was my big. It wasn't my biggest loss. Trust me, that that was a small loss compared to what came after but mm -hmm. it was the one that had the biggest impact and it was you know you can imagine that you know i had eight thousand pounds in savings and i just mm -hmm. lost two thousand pounds on my first trade at that point i was still working i hadn't quit and uh, and 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 i feel that as a species we can learn a lot from honestly facing our losses and uh, uh if i can just perhaps speak a little bit about trend. Would you mind? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I, th I think trend is a somewhat misunderstood concept. Mm -hmm. And so people will urge us to trade with the trend. Uh, and, 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 and look, I always say, hey, it's, it's, if someone says to me, you're trading against the trend. And I said, in which time frame are you looking at? <laughs> You said that in your book too. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. How do you know what time frame? Yeah, <laughs> they're all because different. How, how often is it that sometimes when you, uh, when you, you place a, a short order, sorry, you place a position with trend and then the market mm -hmm. just hammers you and you go, mm -hmm. well, that wasn't very trending of the market to do that. It was supposed to go higher. And so I, I think that it isn't so much what you trade. It is, I don't really care whether you, people think I'm trading with trend or against the trend. I have a reason for doing what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. I, I, there's a lot of money to be made in the turning points as well when you get them yeah. right. And that's actually what we are trying to do because every single uh, market will have a swing. And that's why we're called swing traders. And so just because you think you might be trading against the trend, if you actually have a valid reason for doing what you're doing and you have a stop loss, then for all I care is knock yourself out. Mm -hmm. You actually have a very good trader uh, called uh, Paul Tudor Jones, mm -hmm. a hedge fund, a multi, a multi, mucho wealthy. And he was once asked, hey, how, how did you know that the U.S. government bonds were going to turn where they did? And being Paul Tudor Jones, he said, what? Because I tried three times before and I'd failed. So the fourth time mm -hmm. I got lucky, but three times I got stopped out for a small loss. And the fourth one, I actually caught the whole thing. To yeah. me, that's a great story of someone who was supposedly trading against the trend. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, if I may just start, if you analyze my results from my day trading in January, mm -hmm. I made approximately 80,000 pounds in January. Mm -hmm. I had a hit rate of 43%. Mm -hmm. I was I was wrong or break even more right. than I was right. And right. yet I still managed to make money. And mm -hmm. so why am I telling you that? Is it to show off that I made 80? Hardly because I lost the 
<laughs> the money. I've lost that, so there wasn't much to show off, is there? Um, I'll make it back. <laughs> but 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 to to illustrate to you, you can actually be a profitable trader with a hit rate of forty three percent. And I think that what the real key to success is emotional management and money management. Yeah. But but I. If I should ask you a question, Amanda, what do you find the easiest to do to run a winner or run a loser? Well, for me, I add to my winners. And that is something that I've been consistently training on. But in the beginning, it was holding on to my losers for sure. That was always the easiest. But because yeah. we what is they say? Hope you don't want to close it down. No, yeah. hope dies. Hope dies last, right? right? So as long as the position is open, ah, it might turn around. It might turn mm -hmm. around. That's yeah. the real. And then when you are running a winning position, you go, oh, I better get it home. You know, I better harvest this one exactly. because I don't what want it to. I know. Right. What if it turns around? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't know if I wrote this in the book, but actually, what we have to train, if we have to con condense it into a, a, a sentence, it is that. We actually have to become fearful where when when we are hopeful, we should be fearful. Right. Hopeful that a, a, a position is turning, a losing position is turning around. And when we are fearful, we actually learn, have to train our minds to be hopeful. So when we are right. fearful that the profit should disappear, we have to mm -hmm. be hopeful that it will continue. Yep. I love that. Um, somebody said, if you have several losers in a row, how do you handle that stress and not tell yourself that you are a failure at trading? That's a powerful okay. question. <laughs> Actually, if I if I had that lady in front of me, I, I would want to I want to sit her down, look her in the eyes, and say, "Hey, listen, lady, you need to be very mindful of how you speak to yourself because yeah. success and failure." coexist there cannot be one without the other because imagine amanda that everything you touched turned to gold where mm -hmm. would the stimulation come from the stimulation comes from the friction the stimulation in life comes from the adversity that we experience and so mm -hmm. if you have free losing trades yes of course you might feel that the cortisol is coagulating around your body. And so, you know, sunlight, fresh air, exercise, burning off those stress hormones is something that is part of my routine. If you had any idea how hard it is to lose 20, 30,000 pounds in a morning, if you think that I am, I know my title is called best loser wins, but it doesn't mean that I like losing. I accept right. it. But I still have a physical response. My nervous system reacts to it. And I have to look after the this vehicle. And I have mm -hmm. to make sure that I feed it well. I have to make sure that I nurture it because it reacts. It really mm -hmm. generally reacts. So I need to get out there and burn it off through exercising, through yoga, meditation, anything that fits my particular bill. Because no one goes through this business without having uh, mental adversity. And mental and physical, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when you have an argument with your husband, you know, as perfect as it is, as perfect as he is, you know, it's like sometimes he really irritates me. I'm sure you all experience that, that we just infuriate you. And you just got to remove yourself from the situation. It's the best thing is walk away. And right. let yourself calm down and just find that inner balance. All right, I can face you again now. Right. <laughs> we men, we're exactly the same. Sometimes you infuriate us. We just got to stay. It's just normal, isn't it? Yeah. So good. Uh, Cruz says, Tom, do you have a limited amount of active uh, or pairs that you trade? I think they mean active trades or pairs that you trade, like four or five or more. That's a good question because, yeah. you know, the, the, the dopamine kind of go, oh, everything is moving. But mm -hmm. I think in my, in my early careers, I'm giving you advice now, I would probably try and focus on the majors, you know, mm -hmm. euro dollar, sterling dollar, dollar Swiss and dollar yen. And also what I call the minor majors, like euro yen is a really good one. 
to trade. I know it's classified as a minor currency pair, but it's incredibly volatile mm. uh, because of the interest rates in Europe versus interest rates in Japan that are negative. Um, and so you have the proverbial smorgasbord. You, you are, you've gone into a restaurant and there's every single dish under the sun, but mm. you may just want to limit yourself a little bit of what you do. I actually do believe, not everybody shares that opinion, but I do believe that some currency pairs, they will sort of dance to their own vibrations, dance to mm -hmm. their own tunes. And sometimes, you know how you, sometimes you meet people and you, you gel with them better? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you, you come away and going, yeah, didn't, didn't quite, I didn't quite feel him or her. Mm -hmm. I, I think that trading is a little bit the same. There are certain yeah. instruments that I quite get. And then there's other instruments other instruments that I don't quite understand why they yeah. are the way they are. And if you have those feelings, I think you should pay heed to them. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. It's like intuition. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people are curious about, I guess what your thoughts are. If you have any advice on capital management, I think even more, I, uh, as far as just Capital management, like risk, um, yep. risk management. I do trading multiple pairs in one account. Just yeah. what are your kind of thoughts on that? Okay, children, don't do what I do. Okay, <laughs> that's that's my first piece of advice because <laughs> I'm a risk taker as they come. So please don't do that. You know when when you when if, you know when you see that movie series called the fast and the furious or yeah. fast and furious and then they have this disclaimer before and after saying this is professional okay. stuntmen don't do this at home don't drive like us uh, yeah. i would say please don't take the risk that i do okay um try in your early development to no more risk no more than a certain amount of percentages and you know there's this common uh, idiom don't trade more uh, don't risk more than one percent Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, personally I, I've always had a bit of a hard time with the risk 1% mm -hmm. because I'm thinking well I put $10,000 into my account why would I only risk 100 then I might mm -hmm. as well just have $1,000 into the account and risk 100 why, why mm -hmm. have all that capital tied up and the reason why I feel that way Amanda is because I find that you're creating a false sense of security by having mm -hmm. a big account. And and so you lose and you go, oh, it doesn't matter. There's still plenty of money in the account. Right. I would rather bet on someone who was trading on a shoestring than someone that had a huge account because I believe that it, it has to hurt to lose. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't deviate you from the path, but I believe that it has to hurt. And the reason why I am hurting as much as I am right now is because I, I, I'm a very wealthy man, very wealthy. Uh, but if losing 120,000 pounds didn't hurt me, I would quit my job. I really would. It might be a very small portion of my overall wealth, but it's meant to hurt. Otherwise, there's something wrong with your motivation. Mm. and so um yeah so but i wouldn't like to be the one that tells you you should risk one percent or two percent it's probably in that area but i think that you need to tailor that to something that is emotionally meaningful and being mindful of who you are as a human being not you amanda but as a species, it mm. needs to that be that sweet spot between it needs to hurt, but it can't be detrimental right. to my development. Yeah. I love so that the, so, so, so the gains that you make, Amanda, they need to be meaningful. It can't be a demo account. The reason why demo accounts do not work is because you know, they detach you from the emotional component. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, demo accounts are great to learn a platform to all how does right. buttons work. And, um, but, but otherwise, anyway, I'll shut up and I'll let you ask the next question. Sorry. 
That's really good. That's so powerful. Um, Maya said, Tom, sometimes you step away from trading and reset your mind. Can you share your reset methodology? Yes. In the old days, before I got so bloody saintly, ice cream, <laughs> um, exercise, fresh air, uh, meditation. I use a lot of visualization. It, it, it's, uh, and I don't want to go all frou-frou on you. I don't want to go all hippie on you, but the, the the mental component of my game is of extreme importance. Um, and, and so when, say, it's been, yeah, I'll tell you what I've done during these last four days. I've exercised a lot harder and I've spent a lot more time out in nature. Mm. And so actually, Amanda, can I tell you a funny story? Yeah. You remember I told you that I don't actually know the first thing about golf, mm -hmm. but near uh, one of the places I live, there's a golf course. And so when I go through, uh, when I go through my bad times, I walk on the golf course often mm -hmm. early in the morning or so, like, so, you know, don't get hit by a golf ball, <laughs> but then my mind to distract me begins to look for the golf balls. And Amanda, I say this with a little bit of embarrassment, but I have a collection of nearly two and a half thousand golf balls wow. that I have found. I got these enormous bin containers full <laughs> of golf balls, which, yeah. is, which is ironic because I don't know what to do with them. Actually, I do because... I, I, did you know, Amanda, that all the proceeds from Best Loser Wins goes to charity? Did, did I, I tell did you that? No, nope. I do that. So, um, Oh, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, so uh, I just got a, a royalty check for $20,000. And I bought a van. Uh, actually, this is I'm talking past tense now. But so my first royalty check, I started a, a charity uh, with a good friend of mine, Liz, uh, who was much more entrenched in it. And so we secured some premises. Uh, it was an old restaurant that uh, had gone bust during COVID. And so all the equipment was there. Then we bought a van, a food truck. And so we, and then we engaged local supermarkets. And so we pick up food that is out of date. And then mm -hmm. we prepare in the kitchen and we feed the homeless. There's a, a, a disproportionate amount of uh, drug addicts in the area. And, and I, 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 God, I feel so sorry for me. So it was a very cold winter. And so, uh, so the money bought uh, uh, 70 sleeping bags so that these poor people actually don't, you know, freeze their, mm -hmm. uh, freeze their butts off. Uh, and so every single penny goes into uh, charity. So at the moment, I'm supporting this uh, little girl, Isma. Isma was born, uh, um, uh, what do you call her? You know, multi-handicapped, but with it, mm -hmm. but 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 her biggest problem was her epileptic seizures, mm -hmm. and so um and, and the regulation in Europe is unfortunately very different to the regulation in say America, where I think cannabis medicine is uh, is more established, and mm -hmm. and so um so um uh, Isma's uh, mother uh, through a friend reached out to me, and 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 through that we uh, we secured um. Uh, vital uh, cannabis medicine, and and uh, and she sent me a video, and it's just so sweet because this little girl, and she's like three years old, and I saw before videos, and then like obviously she's still somewhat limited, but you know she's got this big smile on her face, and you just feel like oh my god, that money is actually making a difference in someone else's yeah. life because she's yeah. getting that 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 they call it medical cannabis yeah. uh, medicine. And it mm -hmm. has a proven effect on the amount of seizures. So poor little Isma, she would have 80, 90 seizures in a day. And that's what mm -hmm. actually can kill her. And so right. now it has just been vastly reduced. Uh, and so uh, for me, it's also, you know, the reason why I'm doing something like this is also, look, I'm an extremely professional, I'm very hard-nosed trader. But, you know, there has to be a deeper meaning with also making money. Right. And, and and it sort of boils down to the whole Lucy story that I that I told you uh, earlier. It's like, well, how did we as a species evolve? Well, we did by bloody sharing our experiences. We shared information so that we could all elevate our own game. Right. And right. that 
and, and so that's why I spent my time doing this. Also, I also find that when you teach, there's a Latin saying that ki uh, scripit bis leakit. It means that he who writes uh, uh, learns twice. And I find mm. that when I teach, I'm mm -hmm. also crystallizing some of my own thoughts. And I'm surely mm. you as a teacher, Amanda, also mm. feels that you, you're gaining so much from actually teaching your own method. Mm -hmm. And it and 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 then people give you feedback going, hey Amanda, yeah. I don't quite understand why you're using that particular particular thing. And so you, you go, yeah, well, maybe I just need to review that. And so it also is teaching is also a way of holding up a mirror to yourself and going, yeah. could I do better? Can I do it differently? And mm -hmm. I think that's what I absolutely love about this experience of life is that it affords you an opportunity to just learn. Yeah. It's a real shame that I can't take it with me. <laughs> Although some yeah. people argue can I'm not in that camp. It's just when I'm gone, I'm gone. But uh, hey, we all have our different perspectives on life, isn't it? I just love that so much too, because it's a testament to when your cup is overflowing, then it can flow overflow into others. And so your 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 decision to give back and have your proceeds, the book of your, you know give back to your community and people around you. That is such a something for all of us to strive to be more like and even more reason for all of us to get really good at trading, especially if you have the heart for pouring into other people because that's what trading can give you. It can allow you to do those things. Um, so that is incredibly impactful. I love that you shared that. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely, I do. Anyway, so thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, allow me to share my thoughts about this. This is such a strange world because mm -hmm. you really need to unlearn so much about yourself. That That's the irony of trading is that on, on the surface of things, it seems so easy. And then when you dive into it, you realize that every single emotion you feel about it needs to be turned on its head. And right. that's where the true, uh, uh, shall we say, transformation comes in, that, mm -hmm. that you actually have to want that and not that many people want that transformation. Because, right. you know, that's a bit like the butterfly cocoon story. It actually mm -hmm. requires quite a lot of pain to go through that transformation, Amanda. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and actually sucking up the losses to go, it, just because I had free losses uh, doesn't mean that I have to change my strategy. I just went into a steam. I went into a cluster. Yeah. It really shines. Yeah. Trading really shines a light on all the pieces of your, of your soul that need work. <laughs> That's it's a bit like, well, Amanda, just, just because you asked the three different men out on a date and they all said, no, it doesn't mean you'll stop asking a man out on a date, right? right. You exactly. still carry on. You, you, you got to be able to withstand some adversity. But if so you good. if you if you just if you fall at the first hurdle, you won't. Right. You know, I always say that uh, your your life success is is directly correlated your ability to withstand your, your the 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 the, uh, the rejections that will inevitably stand in your way. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Everybody is just saying so many wonderful things about you in the chat and just saying, thank you. We don't want to take up any more of your time because I know you've got a busy day ahead and you're probably exhausted. Maybe you could use a nap. I don't know, <laughs> but we jet, just want to say <laughs> jet lag is real. Can I just say it is that real. Jet, jet lag is really real. Yeah. When I got here to Bangkok, I was like 10 hours dislocated. I'm going, oh so, you, so you go to bed at eight and then you wake up at midnight and go, well, yeah, that's it. Yes. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> you're lying there. Going, what am I supposed what to do now? I'm not sure. That, is that it dude, you look at the phone like, is it Monday or is it Sunday? <laughs> I know it's so true. Anyway, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful experience to be in your company. You're a great interviewer and, and my offer to come back stands, but perhaps more importantly, my network of other men who are extremely accomplished uh, and even someone like Linda Bradford Rashke, you should probably tap and tap mm -hmm. into. She's also a great man, but you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, but the, but the female version of a, of a great trader. And so wow. anyway, I wish, I wish, I wish you all luck. And if I can help you, just let me know. Okay. Thank you, Tom. We're so appreciative. I can't thank you enough. You have been incredibly inspiring to us all. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. All you right. Take care we'll of yourself. All the best. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye, Amanda. Bye-bye, everybody. You look after yourself. Stay safe. Stay strong. Bye-bye.